Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya It is our Wisdom of the Sages podcast, your daily yoga podcast with your, ho- with your host Raghunath and co-host and senior educator of the Bhakti Center, Coach Duba Das. Welcome to the show. I'm here uh, with uh, our executive producer part two, Tom. You can't see him, but he's flapping his wings over there. <laughs> Mare is in transit. She's uh, flying back on a crazy flight back to America. We'll see her, and then then I'm leaving for California, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be away. We're gonna have to adjust the time because California's three hours even earlier. Gotta figure out how to do that. Okay. So if I do it at five in the morning, it's still gonna be eight o'clock here. What here what day do you leave? I leave super early Tuesday morning. Tuesday, okay, so Wednesday will be at a different time. Yeah, yeah. All right. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. We do this every day, practically speaking. Even when I travel, we try to throw it. Uh, we try to like adjust it. Um, it's good for me, actually. It keeps me like on tune and with accountability for the Bhagavatam. I find I work good with accountability. I don't know about you, Kostuba, but I like it when I say, nope, I have to do this today. Mm. I, I, some people don't like rules. I love rules. I'm a rule guy. I love rules. Rules are good. I'm not saying I missed a rule, but I think I work good with parameters. Like, for example, all you can eat. I don't work good with that. (laughs) (laughs) Like, all you can eat food bars. I don't like it. Or even going to like ashrams or so, like, yeah, whatever you. I was like, "Uh, seconds are free. You can go back for seconds. Yeah, come on up. Of course. I don't work good with that. I work with here's a bowl, fill the bowl to the limit. That's all you get. I want like that. Okay. Pay, Pay by the weight. I like that. There's a limit. There's a cutoff. You know, it's like, it's almost like you want to, yeah, you can eat as much as you want. It's going to cost you. I like, I like things like that. I don't like all you can eat. I don't do good with that. I like people telling me that's enough or else what happens. I suffer from this, that, that classic mantra. I say, what is it? Uh, Oh, this is the the after I finish eating mantra. What have I done? (laughs) What have I done? That's usually when I stop eating. Okay. So, I don't know if you're a rule person, you might understand that. Um, I, I, I find parameters good in my life, and so anyway, how do I get talking about that? Because are you saying that waking up every day and doing the show is like it, it kind of keeps you? Yeah, it's good accountability, and I will say that we have such a nice group on our Zoom. If you want to join our Zoom group, they're here every day. It's pretty. Imp- it's pretty impressive, actually. Um, and when they show up again, like they're riddled with shame and, and, and guilt, but, uh, for the most part, they show up and they, uh, uh, tune in and they keep in contact with each other on telegram on a regular basis. But now we're doing on Patreon soon, which Kostuba will announce today or tomorrow. Uh, and I'm excited about that. So if you're interested in joining all of that, you just write, write us, or if you have a question, you can write, uh, Mara at, uh, wisdom of the sages, one Oh eight at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, I find that this book that we study, it's so powerful. There's a lot of books on bhakti now too. This is so powerful. It starts to change the way you see the world. And it's, it says in the book itself, it's meant to create a revolution in the hearts of humanity. And it's exactly what I can see. It's working for me. It's, it actually works for me by doing it. When we do little things on a regular basis, that's how we make big changes. Little steps make massive changes. If a, fl- a plane is flying to LA from New York and it's a little bit off track, it's going to end up in Seattle. So little changes make a big deal in a week from now, in a month from now, in a year from now, little tweaks of our day. And what does that mean? I'm going to add in some mantra meditation every day. I'm going to chant on my beads one round a day. If we're listening to this show on uh, on Zoom, you should all have a, a malas. That's 108 malas. Because the this, this sounds crazy. And yesterday was crazy talk day, right? Um, we talked about deities and understanding what is a deity and how, how, how that can be so foreign or so weird. 
a lot of people were like, no, it's completely normal. You're weird, Raghunath. But no, no, no. So Katie Bell. Katie Bell wrote me because I was telling her about dressing the deity. And she goes, yeah, you're right. You, I really thought you were nuts that when we were in India. So <laughs> it is weird for some people. I was running around trying to dress a little Gopal. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, look at this dress. Doesn't this look good on him? Isn't he adorable? What a cute little deity. <sighs> so How anyway. many of your students think you're weird, Rogu? Do you ever wonder that? You know what? I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay. I, got, I got over what people think of me a long time ago. And then, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that character trait. I have a lot of bad character traits. That's a good one. Um, but what were you just talking about, Kostub? Keep me online. Um, a little little increments, little of tweaks, little tweaks. little tweaks, because we go through this world. This is what I find: we go through this world where we've been hurt, we've had some trauma, we've had some bad experience, some trust issues, and I take that into the world, and I don't trust him, and I don't trust her. It screws up with my relationships, uh, my friendships, my um, uh, my with my with my spouse. The Bhagavatam assists you in healing that. It gets us back to what we are beneath the dent. And if you had no massive trauma, no major hiccups or potfalls, pot, uh, potholes in your life, you still have to react to other people who have trust issues, um, who have been hurt. And what I can do is, what is wrong with this person? Why is this guy such a jerk all the time? Why is she you're driving me? Whatever it is, we have our... We see people who, just like if you're driving a car, you might be driving straight, but if a person's just weaving all over the road, you're gonna get damaged. So even if you feel like, no, my life was pretty good, my life was pretty sane, but you, you encounter people that have had issues, then the, this apparent natural tendency is to, is to hold resentment towards people, get angry and offended at people, create an enemy, People who act appropriately, they're my friends. People who act inappropriately, they're my enemies. The Bhagavatam teaches you radical tolerance, radical understanding, radical love. Love doesn't mean I love the people that are like me and that like me. That's not love. That is an exclusive type of uh, materialism. These people support my ego, I like them. It's not that. The Bhagavatam teaches we have to be so understanding that when we see a people act like a total jerk, we love them anyway. What? <laughs> hard to do it. It's hard to do. I'm not saying it's easy work. It's tough work. But we, 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 we protect. Once I take an offense, Maya tricked me. Once I get offended, Maya tricked me. To walk around with an enemy is a big, it's my big problem. What is that bird noise? Are they birds? They didn't come in with me, I, swear. <laughs> I hear like flocks of birds. <laughs> There's some migration going on. <laughs> anyway, what do you think about that? Once I hold a resentment towards a jerky person, yeah. I'm the jerk. Mm -hmm. I'm the jerk. Because in bhakti, we have to get over that. That doesn't mean you're going to get along with everybody. I, you know, there's, there's people practicing bhakti I just don't get along with. But I'm just not going to go there with them i'll just keep them at a distance and i'm not going to even hold that resentment it just doesn't work that relationship doesn't work it doesn't mean i'm going to like everybody that's understandable but when i'm going around seeing friends and enemies people who stroke my ego people who don't um liking only post people who are like me and like just getting into a tom yeah that guy's such a jerk i'm off track i've lost my spirit what are we doing we are here's the deal about hurt people they hurt people Hmm? Yes. Okay. Hurt people hurt people. Is what that you yours that? or did you get that from somewhere? Huh? Did you make that up or did you get that from somewhere? Hurt people hurt people. I steal everything, brother. You know okay. that. <laughs> hurt people hurt people. It's a good one though. <laughs> Write that down, Lindsay, please. Hurt people hurt people. And and we and if we're and if we're and if and if we're that's petty. not a double command to hurt people. Yeah. Hurt people, hurt people. <laughs> hurt people twice. Once you, once you kick them down the stairs, you go down and you punch them in the head. <laughs> no, it's people that have been hurt. 
<laughs> Let me, hurt that, people. That, that needs a purport, I think. <laughs> people that, that people that have been hurt end up hurting others. That's what I meant gotcha. to say. You're right. You can read That's that. That's like wrong. the Bhagavad Gita inaction within in ac- action within inaction within action. <laughs> <laughs> Hurt action and action and inaction and inaction. Yeah. But hurt people hurt people. I get it. Okay. So let me, let me, what um, do you think about that? I, I want to see if I correctly understand what you're presenting here. You're saying that like we may feel affection for certain individuals and we call that love. Sure. But, you're, but if I understand correctly, you're saying that there's a, there's a, a kind of a more real love because if that's by nature conditional is in a sense, what you're saying is like, if you've got certain qualities that I can relate to and you behave in a particular way, then I feel affection for you. But if you don't, if externally you behave in ways or say things or do things that, that um, rub me wrong for whatever reason, then I have no affection for you. And you're saying that, that you can call that love, but there's something more true and more real and more genuine uh, that we could call real love that has to do with, that's on a spiritual level. So it has nothing to do with the material qualities that one is expressing. I mean, if you really think about what love is. I want to know what love is. You want to know what love is? Tell me, right. I want to know what love is. (laughs) (laughs) I want you to show me. You set me up. (laughs) Here's what, let me just share with you, like a 14 year old Raghunath. This was my realization when I was 14. Okay. Oh, that girl in ninth grade. She's so beautiful. I love her. I love her. And then I would think, would you love her if she was missing a pinky? (laughs) Yes. Yes. I'd love her with, of course I would. Would you love her? (laughs) Would you love her? (laughs) She's missing an arm. (laughs) And then I'd be like, yes. Would you love her if she had no nose? Hmm. Like this, I'm talking to a ninth grade boy. This, um, this, is, this is my brain in ninth grade. I'm letting okay. you glimpse into my ninth grade brain. And then you start to think like, is my love merely based on flesh? Okay. Like, would you tolerate this? Sometimes we, sometimes if people, I think Oscar Wilde says this, sometimes people who are very beautiful, you just tolerate any of their crazy stuff just because they're beautiful. Isn't it? Right? He says something like, beautiful people can get away with incredible types of, so Google that up, Oscar Wilde, beautiful, tolerate, tolerate beautiful, see what comes up. <laughs> but it's one of these things, what, what are we actually loving? Hair? People lose their hair. A face? People get scarred in their face. Ears? People don't fall in love with ears, but you know, in jiu-jitsu, you get these big gnarled ears. <laughs> cauliflower ears call, cauliflower right? ears looks like a piece of cauliflower you know what are we falling in love with based on beauty love soon dies shakespeare say that again based on beauty love soon dies oh okay mm. in other words love that is based on beauty soon dies right based on beauty so love has to be so real love is pushing us to be to go more subtle it's not just based on skin. That's why there's a, that, that's why in this whole entire Vedic culture and this culture, it, it's truthfully, it's, it's just a cult, an intelligent culture is based on commitments. That's why commitments are so powerful because the mind is lazy. Oh, hold on a second. Tom, Oscar Wilde breaks with the common belief that shows us external. Be- this isn't a quote, Tom. It is. Oh, it is? Oscar Wilde quotes that. Oh, ah, Tom! <laughs> <laughs> Where's Mara? Let's just stick with the, the You got one Shakespeare in there, Rogue. You're doing okay, good. Shake, okay. Uh, what were we talking about? Um, we, well, commitments are very powerful. Oh, commitments. The power of commitments. See, the mind tends to be incredibly lazy and incredibly whimsical, and is always looking for a reason to break a fixed commitment. And the whole yoga system is, how can I just hold that mind steady? That's why patience is such a huge teachings. You know, Nandi the bull represents patience. Nandi, uh, Shiva's mm. bull. And patience is such a big thing in, in quote, Hindu thought, and how it, it develops so much virtues. So you just, that deep tolerance that's why there's th- that's why there are things like uh uh 
a samskara of. This is actually kind of neat. Okay, he's Popcorn? okay. It better be good, Tom, because I'm inter you're interrupting my flow. Sorry. I was channeling God there for a minute. Well, you asked him to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you don't love someone for their looks or their clothes or their fancy car, but because they sing a song only you can hear. All right, that was not it. That wasn't it, Tom. It's, it's, we're closing the Oscar Wilde chapter, Tom. Okay. <laughs> okay, so anyway, there's a power, there's a power, and that's why they have these things like a marriage. You marriage, you make a commitment. And what do you do in that commitment? You get around, you get all your friends together. You get your family together. You get their family together. You all come together in what you consider a holy place. It could be in nature on the beach. It could be in a Roman Catholic church. It could be in a, an ashram or a temple. You come together and then you get a holy person, that holy priest of that tradition. It could be a friend, it could, your best friend. And you make some public statement to the universe. You got some guy walking around with a camera. And you freeze that in space and you make these vows. And you put that picture on your mantle. And then you say, you know what? We, we just created a contract. Two have become one. Um, and in that container, you get to grow up. You know why? Because as soon as you put yourself in your container, the mind is like, I gotta get out of the container. And then you start to curb your crazy mind. It's what we actually do in a yoga class. What do you think about that, Kastuba? In the sense that it's controlling the mind. I have you, to give up yeah. self. You're in this pose. You don't want to be in this pose. You're holding warrior two. Your shoulders are burning. The teacher's just like telling jokes, walking around. And you are, you know, you're, you're trying to breathe deep. You're, you're sweating profusely. You know, your mind is sort of getting angry. You don't want to be there. You have things to do. You got a lot of stuff going on in your day, but you got to pull the mind back. Teacher says, breathe. You're holding and you're tolerating and you're overcoming the mind. Okay. So, so any so, commitment we have, whether yeah. you're doing a, a, a water fast, a juice fast, a gluten-free diet, anytime you try to control the senses, we are creating a healthy separation from the mind and the senses. And in that toleration, we learn to tolerate the mind. And therefore, you know what you do? You, you're also, you, you also override some of the, um, the depression that comes with the mind. The, de the mind can get very sort of depressed sometimes. <laughs> sometimes the mind can get very depressed. Why? Because the mind is whimsical and I can indulge in that depression. That's why sometimes fasting, commitments, when I just say no to something, it helps me just sort of discipline my mind. Just get busy out. fixed on something else. Take, taking control of it rather than it taking control of you. Yeah, not just busy thinking of something else, but noticing that the mind is just going to be whimsical. So that's, that's the power of uh, commitments. And you'll hear about these in the stories and the Puranas, the Mahabharat. Srimad Bhagavatam out, this person took a vrata or a vow. And with yeah. that vow, they are like very firm with their vow. Because commitments, increments of change have a long-term effect. And if, we, if you put in that time, it's a, there's, there's, all, there's certain, for example, a, an agave plant. An agave plant, some agave plants, they don't even blossom for 100 years. Really? Yeah, they just had one not that long ago in the botanical garden in New York City. They had to like open up the ceiling because it grows so huge. And then at the hundredth year, it sprouts a stalk that's like 40 feet high. Wow. And then seeds and then dies. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> it just shoots all its seeds everywhere and dies. Anyway, my point is there's a fruit of just sticking things out sometime with, with everything. Okay. There's a sweet fruit. I was hoping that would be more inspirational, but everybody seemed bored. No, okay. no, no. I, Let's I think continue. You, you just hit on so many big topics there that we're just trying to take it all in. Okay. Well, anyway, my point is we're, we make a commitment to this Bhagavatam and watch, watch it become like a magical um, GPS in your life. And I say, like, you know, I've been into bhakti for years now, 32 years. 
but but I, I will say there's a power in just showing up and reading the Bhagavatam every day, no matter what happens. It's very powerful. Let's do it. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. We chanted that already. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Rabu, we generally we chant the Narayanam Naras Namaskar. Oh, yeah. yeah, this Rabu. way. <clears throat> that comes at the beginning of the show. Oh, that comes. We already did on the moment. <laughs> Help me. Narayanam namaskritya naram chaiva narotamam vedyam saraswatim vyasam tato jayam mudiraye. Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of our conquest, one should first offer obeisances to the Supreme Lord Narayan. Unto Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning and to Srila Vyasadeva, the author. Nasta prayeshva badreshu nityam bhagavat sevaya bhagavati uttama shloke bhaktir bhavati naishtaki. By regular attendance and classes in the Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart com becomes completely eradicated in loving service to the transcendent Lord whose praise with transcendental songs is established within the heart as an irrevocable fact. Om Jnana Tamarandasya Jnana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Nina Tazmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Okay, reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam first canto. There's 12 cantos. We're only on the first. Is that depressing? <laughs> Not at all. Okay, good. It's a good, it's a good canto. Chapter 5, text 34. Um... Thus, I think that you might have read this. We did 33, which is similar. Thus when, all, okay. Thus, when all a man's activities are dedicated to the service of the Lord, all of our activities, body, mind, words, those very activities which cause their perpetual bondage become the destroyers of the tree of work. That's, what we, that's how we ended yesterday. Oh, okay. So when we, when we dedicate all of our activities, our thoughts, right? Our th We've got a lot of thoughts going on in there our thoughts. Um, by the way, like we were saying earlier, if you have this angry thought, if you have an enemy, anybody have an enemy out there? You got to get rid of your enemy. You got to get rid of that. It's not a spiritual thought. It's not a thought offered to God. Get I rid of them, not by killing them. <laughs> <laughs> don't kill your you gotta get rid of your enemy <laughs> you remember hurt people hurt people <laughs> hurt your enemies hurt your en i thought it was about love your enemies hurt them hurt your enemies no it's it, it, yeah you know we have to ha get rid of the concept of this person is an enemy that's what we got to get rid of okay this person is an enemy and we got to get rid of this concept of somebody's a jerk if I think somebody is a jerk, I am just as – they might act jerky, but we got to understand that I am just as petty as they are. And to the degree that you find the jerkiness in someone, guess what? You are training yourself. You're training yourself to see jerkiness. And that sounds – listen, it's stinking thinking. It's training yourself to see what's wrong in others. And you know what's, you know what's radical to that? Train yourself to see what's right. Hmm. That will change your life. <laughs> Train yourself to see what's right in people. People will really appreciate it. You'll, you'll, you'll actually change them. How do I change the mean dog? Kick the dog? I adopted this dog. The dog's totally mean. Guess what? Dog's got a backstory. That mean <laughs> dog has a backstory. It was probably a hurt dog. That It was a hurt dog. dog. Hurt dogs hurt people. Well, Vivi's asking, what if someone is hell-bent on making you an enemy despite your efforts? Well, there's certain people you have to just pull back from. But you can't hate them. You can't, right? You can't hate them. That's against the, the rules. Compassion and understanding. So Compassion I, I like and understanding. Thank you, Tom. He's a very wise executive producer. I, I like that you use this term radical. You began radical. There, radical, right? radical understanding, radical, radical tolerance, because radical in a sense, forgiveness. In a sense, what you're saying is you got to get radical. If you want, if we're all getting up here at 5 a.m. to read Bhagavatam, obviously we're a group of people here that is kind of like 
as has a certain level of seriousness or desire. Except the Europeans. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But has a certain <laughs> level of, of intensity, uh, a, a certain level of intensity in their desire to transform. Sure. And so if we're going to put the effort in, why not go all the way? And, and it seems to me like what you're saying is to get to that stage that, of like these sages, like these sages that are in the pages of the Bhagavatam, if we really want to get there, it's going to involve getting a bit radical. And, and the interesting thing is there is always almost like a desire to get radical, but genuinely, ge- uh, generally, our radicalness is changing other people to be, right. to be different. I want to change the world. I want, I want uh, uh, some uh, social change. And we realize that the actual change, the people, if you get very into social change, you become incredibly angry very quick and oftentimes very resentful and hateful. And if you're you becoming hateful, guess what? You are doing something wrong. Okay. That's a tattoo. That's a tattoo. <laughs> Maybe not getting a good hate- one. <laughs> Louie, you got any more space on your body? If you're getting hateful, you're doing something doing something wrong. That's the tattoo. Okay. If you're getting hateful, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. yeah you know, I, I, maybe I, not a tattoo. The, the truth, I, I'm into the truth of it, but I don't know what kind of good, that's the best tattoo in the world. It might not be a good tattoo. Okay. I don't even know if that would be a mug, but, <laughs> but it, that's, it's true. Truism. If you're that's, getting hateful on this path of Bhakti, you're getting something wrong. If you really want to be radical in your activism, turn it around on yourself. Radically tolerant, radically understanding. I like where I'm going with this. Radically understanding, radically forgiving. Boom, you're a radical now. So we need to get radical. You're a revolutionary. The, the spiritual practice, has, it's not a laid back thing. It's not like a, it's a radical thing. It's an intense thing. It's like that person's really treating me like crap. I don't care. I'm not going to hold it it's against. Easy, it's easy to hate, right? It's easy to hate everybody doing stupid things. It just gets me. Turn on the news. You'll hate everybody. Oh, this guy, I can't believe they're doing that. Why, don't you just walk outside? Why are they doing this? You drive by some factory pumping out sit in the air. Why? You look at the river. It's tall polluted. Why? Where are we wrong? You know, they're spraying, you know, crops, dusting things. Why? I just want to point the finger at everybody. But when I radically start to change, that's the beginning of an actual world changing. Otherwise, you just have these constant age old battles between countries, lands, North and South, uh, you know, East versus West, Republican and Democrat. It never ends. I'm right, they're wrong. Yeah. All right, Rogo, I like where you're going. I like that. Imagine if Israel said, you know what? I got some issues. We got some issues. And then Palestine said, well, you think you got issues? Well, let's hear, hear about my issues. I, I, we've got some issues. You know, we've done some wrong things. And then Israel said, well, I'm not going to focus on what you've been doing wrong. I'm going to focus on what I've been doing wrong. Do I have to come in here? Do I have to do everything in this place? (laughs) (sighs) Okay. Continuing on. I haven't got worked up in a long time. I've been real NPR Raganoff for a while, huh? Okay. Thus, okay, I'm gonna skip that NPR ragu. Hashtag, Hashtag NPR ragu, please. Whatever work is done here in this life for the satisfaction of the mission of the Lord is called bhakti yoga. I'm gonna read that again. Whatever work is done here in this life for the satisfaction of the mission of the Lord is called bhakti yoga or transcendental loving service to the Lord. And what is called knowledge becomes a concomitant factor. Can you explain that, oh wise one? Who, me? Whatever. (laughs) You're my intelligence. I'm just like your mouth. This is, um, you know, there's, there are things that are being said here that when you become more familiar with the Bhagavatam, what it's teaching, you can, you understand what it's referring to. So what happened is that the whole basis of this conversation is that Narda again is telling Vyasadeva that you wrote all this literature, but you weren't direct enough about devotional service. You weren't direct enough about Krishna and getting people connected to Krishna as a person. And if you connect someone to Krishna as a person, then someone can dedicate all their activities to that person and they can connect through yoga. And when you do that, it's called bhakti yoga. 
And, but he's saying, and when you do that, knowledge, the word is jnana, it becomes a concomitant factor. It what comes that? automatically. What's... It comes without extraneous effort, without a separate effort, knowledge. And okay. when you say knowledge, when you say jnana, that implies... Right. When you, in, in, the, in the circles of Vedanta, of this Vedic philosophy, when you say jnana, which means knowledge... It implies also vairagya or renunciation or detachment, right? That when I see the world for what it is, when I really know it, we call that jnana. And when I know it, I can detach myself from it. My material attachment cease, that's called vairagya or, you know, detachment, we call it. Mm-hmm. So he's saying here, you wrote a whole lot of Upanishads that preached about knowledge and detachment. And you're hoping that people would follow that, become detached from the things in this, in this world, and then ultimately surrender to God. But that doesn't always happen, and people become confused, and they begin to think they're God. <clears throat> but if you just if you explain who Krishna is to them, and give them instructions about how they can dedicate their all their activities and connect through bhakti yoga, then that knowledge and detachment it's a concomitant factor. It comes automatically. You don't even have to try for it separately. It comes. Once you're attached to Krishna, you, you let go of the things of this material world. That, okay, that makes sense. And that was, mentioned, here. <laughs> that was mentioned right at the beginning in the second chapter of the first canto, where it says that Gyan and Vairagya, they come automatically to one who's practicing bhakti. That's why I've met people who are not like super bright. or I met, I met some people practicing bhakti that are like, you know, professors and uh, in physics, PhDs. And the, but I've met people who are like practicing bhakti that are almost very simple, maybe not intelligent on an IQ level, but they have like a deep wisdom about them. That's real intelligence, right? That's real intelligence. Making it's like, right okay, decisions. my car doesn't go 120. It goes 40, but I'm going in the right direction. Nice, <laughs> nice. okay. Right? That works. I'm going 40, but I'm going in the right direction. Who cares if you're going 120 backwards? That was my purport of that verse. The general and popular notion is that by discharging fruit of work in terms of the direction of the scriptures or the shastras, one becomes perfectly able to acquire transcendental knowledge. For spiritual realization, bhakti yoga is considered by some to be another form of karma. Uh, you see, uh, yeah, the, another type of work. Karma means like to just some other type of work. But, so to some <clears throat> Vedic philosophers, they don't get it right. And they think any kind of work in this world, even devotional service, it brings karma. It brings reactions. So even that devotional, it may be good for you to take a step forward, but you're still entangled in this world when you're doing that. Hmm. But factually, bhakti yoga is above both karma and jnana. Bhakti yoga is independent of jnana or karma. On the other hand, jnana and karma are dependent on bhakti yoga. This kriya yoga or karma karma yoga as recommended by Narada to Vyas is specifically recommended because the principle is to satisfy the Lord. That's the karma. It's actually to bring you to bhakti. The work is meant to bring you to bhakti. The Lord does not want, uh, his sons, the living beings, means us, to suffer the threefold miseries of life. Therefore, he desires that all of them come to him and live with him, but go back to Godhead. It means that one must purify themselves from the material infection. Oh. When work is performed, therefore, to satisfy the Lord, the performer becomes gradually purified from the material affection. This purification means attainment of spiritual knowledge. Therefore, Knowledge is dependent on karma or work done on behalf of the Lord. Other knowledge being devoid of bhakti yoga or satisfaction of the Lord cannot lead one back to the kingdom of God, which means that it cannot even offer salvation as already explained in connection with the stanza, Naishkaramyam apyachutam bhava vajritam. The conclusion is that a devotee engaged in unalloyed, it's a great word, unalloyed bhakti, specifically in hearing and chanting of the transcendental glories, becomes simultaneously spiritually enlightened by the divine grace as confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. 
You know what I noticed there, Ruggo? What? So, um, let me go back in the commentary here. <clears throat> there was a, okay, here we go. He says when, he said, going back to Godhead, reconnecting, means that one must purify himself from material infections. Great word. Then he says in the next sentence, when work is, when work is performed, therefore, to satisfy the Lord, the performer becomes gradually purified from the material affection. In one sense, he said, infection. You're going to get a little poetic here, aren't you? Well, I was going to say, material the affection. affection. In the, <laughs> infection, my affection to the material world. Material affection. When I feel, um, you know, when I feel drawn towards the material energy in whatever form it is, and I think that that's where my happiness comes from, is material affection. My material affection. Material infection. What do you think about that? I think you I think, are on was that a tattoo. Material affection. You in mug. Material infection. Okay. It's, I don't like it. It's okay. No, it's, it's, an, it's poetic. <laughs> All right. But in any case, I think it's interesting to think about it that way. Yes. Right. Affection. They are a good one. They were good. <laughs> You're just trying to encourage me. <laughs> uh, you keep it writing, was, that, it was you good. Keep writing that poetry. Go you still. try it. <laughs> Infection leads to infection. Thank you, Das Das. While performing duties according to the order of Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, one constantly remembers him, his names, and qualities. So that's that, the okay. meditation during your work. Yeah, that's, that's saying, the, you see, that's going body to mind, right? First, let me engage my body in the service. And then what happens is, naturally, my mind begins to follow the body. I'm giving a head bobble right now. Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll go to the next one. Let us all chant the glories of Vasudev, along with his plenary expanses, Prajumna, Aniruddha, and Shankarshan. <laughs> go. You're, go. <laughs> no, go, go, go. I just like the way he pronounced Shankarshan. 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 Sankarsana. 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 According to the punch, I'm going to just read because you're not reading. According okay. to Pancharatra, Narayan is the primeval cause of all expansions of Godhead. They are Vasudev, Shankarshan, Pradyumna, and Aniruddha. It's like the candles lighting the candles lighting the candles. But in the Vedic paradigm, they all have names. Prajumna is the right is anyway, I'm just going to stop there. <laughs> it's called the Chaturvyuha, but these are four expansions that come from Narayan. Yeah. And, and they people, all play their different roles yeah, in the universes. People grow up in a family that, where they worship one facet of Narayan like this. Yeah. It's interesting how this book is presented and the commentaries because it, it I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an American, I'm an American dude, grew up in America. Yet it's a, there's pieces of it that just go in and touch me. Yet there's people who grew up in India that there's like a whole nother, the purports are so like, I have, I'm having an appreciation now. The purports are so like, uh, what's the word? They can appeal to an Indian culture and they appeal to an American culture simultaneously. And they're almost like, sometimes they'll go, sometimes the things Prabhupada say in the purport go right over my head. But people coming from India are like, yep, 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 yep. And sometimes they'll say something that really just speak to me as an American. Universal appeal. Yes, Arvind. That's exactly what it is. Okay. You know what I mean, right, Kasub? I'd, actually, I'm a little bit lost right now, but that's okay. okay forget it. I'm just... I mean, I guess I know what you mean. Yeah, that's some of the stuff. Like sometimes Prabhupada say something like, um, you know, like the pious activities of digging a well. And right. every American's like, what the hell? Dig a well. Dig a well. Like, you know, to do? Well. I've heard, I've heard, you know how many times I've read the prayer board and heard about digging wells? I was like, who thinks, who's digging wells? Who's going out like to get pious activity from digging a well? Planting a tree we can relate to a little bit more nowadays. Planting a tree, but no one says planting a tree. They say digging a well. Well, no, they say that those are two commonly go together. Digging wells, planting trees. Well, or, or they'll say karmakunda. Karmakunda activities in the Vedas, most of us are like, what? 
Right. Right. Yeah. Anyway. The more we know, the more these purports speak to us. Yeah. Thus, thus he is the actual seer who worships in the form of the transcendental sound representation. There's our mantras. Uh, the supreme personality of Godhead who has no material form. This is a good verse right here. You, you want to comment on that, please? Well, this becomes an important topic throughout the Bhagavatam because we're living in a material world. We're, we're bewildered by it. We're constantly engaged with material energy. But it's saying the actual seer, they, they connect through transcendental sound. That, that, is the, um, that becomes the via media, the, the powerful via, via media that we use to connect. Sound is first. You know, I, I'm sure the commentary will have some interesting stuff to say. Shall I read? Yeah. Our present senses are all made of material elements. My eyes are made out of material elements, my ears, etc. And therefore they are imperfect in realizing the transcendental form of Lord Vishnu. Because Lord Vishnu's form is spiritual, my, my senses are material, they're going to have a hard time connecting. He is therefore worshipped by sound representation via the transcendental method of chanting. Okay? Therefore chanting becomes a, a via media by which we can connect. Anything which is beyond the scope of experience by your imperfect senses can be realized fully through the sound representation, whether it's hearing Bhagavatam or chanting. A person transmitting sound from a far distant place can be factually experienced. If this is materially possible, why not spiritually? This experience is not a vague and personal experience, which many yogic practices may be like. It is actually an experience of the transcendental personality of Godhead who possesses the pure form of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. Satchit Ananda. Speak to me, Rabu. What are your thoughts? I can't stop looking at uh, Jim Rios, whose <laughs> video looks like it's an episode of the Blair Witch Project going on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jim. <laughs> so this guy, like, there's green light, and he's just yes. <laughs> Anyone else can't stop staring at Jim Rios's thing? Oh, there, there's a wolf going right now, licking his face. Okay. I'm so, so in any case, it's just further Sorry. encouragement for Nard, Narda is giving to Vyasa to directly glorify Krishna because that sound is powerful, and we can become actual seers by connecting with that sound, by hearing that sound. It's spiritual. It's not material. Yeah. Give him the full thing. All right, I'll go on. Let's do it. You're good. O Brahmana, thus by, the, thus by the Supreme Lord Krishna, I was endowed first with the transcendental knowledge of the Lord as inculcated in the confidential parts of the Vedas, then with the spiritual opulence, and then with his intimate loving service. Wow. So this is, by the way, again, this is Narada telling his story about in a previous life, how he got to be Narada. Like, how did you get to be you? You know, right? Like Sean Davis, how'd you get to be you? You know, Lori, how'd you get to be you? Mm. We have a backstory from a previous life. Narada's telling his backstory. He was a young boy, son of a maidservant, and he's going around serving these guests. And these guests happen to be liberated soul. And they're talking, he's taking care of them, and re he's receiving all these blessings. And, and Kostu, why don't you just maybe just read that again? And yeah, I, I thought it was, it was three things were mentioned, mm. right? First, these great souls, first they gave him transcendental knowledge of the Lord as inculcated in the confidential parts of the Vedas, in the parts about devotional service, in the parts about bhakti. They shared with him uh, this understanding. And then from understanding that and practicing according to that, uh, he he received spiritual opulences. Now I, I I'm I'm, and I'm interested to read the commentary to put to understand more clearly. I mean, of course, when we think of Narda, he's got the freedom to travel anywhere. He's got this spiritual instrument, the vena that he plays, and when he plays it, it, it like transforms people's lives. So maybe that's what it's talking about. But I think we could also understand that in terms of uh, things like you were talking about earlier: detachment and patience and wisdom and etc. Like, so he got all kind of beautiful, good spiritual qualities or opulences. And then that matured further to intimate loving service to God. 
So let, let's look at the commentary on that. Communion with the Lord by transmission of transcendental sound is non-different from the whole spirit, Lord Krishna. It is a completely perfect method for approaching the Lord. By such pure contact with the Lord, without offense of material conceptions, numbering 10, 10 offenses, Number 10, yeah. the devotee can rise above the material plane to understand the inner meaning of the Vedic literatures including the Lord's existence in the transcendental realm. The Lord reveals his identity gradually to one who has unflinching faith, both in the guru, the spiritual master, and in the Lord. You know the verse? Oh, unflinching faith in the guru. No. Oh, God, I can't think of the first word now, but... God, I put you on the hot seat. Now we're I both on the hot, hot seat. seat. <laughs> hot seated ourselves. Yes, your Deve Parab Bhaktir, your Ta Deve, Agaro. Yeah, the one who has equal faith. Unflinching faith in the Guru and the and in God. Yeah. Yeah. Prakashante Mahatmanaha. Everything's revealed to them. All the by the way, by, by the way, because uh, we understand also faith is done in increments. When we say unflinching faith, that doesn't mean like, I ex we're not looking for people to become cult members just based on, um, well, Raghu tells jokes. I'm just going to like join his cult. Faith comes in small increments. We hear, we apply, and it makes sense. Oh, wow. I put that to my life. That makes sense. I've changed that, right? There is little leaps of faith. For example, if you're listening to Zoom, we say, hey, if you're listening to Zoom, you should be chanting one round of Japa on beads. Now you might say, well, oh, I don't want to do that. But you know what? I trust Raghu I, or just I trust Kostuba. These guys have like steered me in some right directions and they, they read from this Bhagavatam and this Bhagavatam seems to be weighty. Now they're saying step forward. And I trust them. It's reasonable faith. You know, I'm not saying, okay, uh, now I'd like you to uh, leave your families and uh, sign over the title to your car to me. I'm not, it's not like a massive leap of faith. I'm just saying spend 10 minutes a day with malas and chant the Maha Mantra. And the book will make, the Bhagavatam itself will make more sense to you, okay? So that's a reasonable type of faith. I'm not asking you to take a huge leap. It's a little leap. But when you add that little leap to your life, and a lot of you guys have already done that, when you add mantra meditation, you carve out, you sacrifice a certain amount of time a day that usually goes to blah, 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 blah. And you just put it on mantra meditation. That was me talking to myself with these two hands. That was like in the Peanuts cartoons when the, the adults are speaking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when you make that little sacrifice, then the Bhagavatam actually starts to blossom and it makes more sense. Mm. So that reasonable faith, what's the reasonable faith? Well, you know me and Kastuba, you've, you've been with us. And then I'm just saying, okay, now step it forward. They may need and, a little something more than that. What's that? They may need a little, a little may, bigger, bigger boost to base the faith on. But. Well, yeah, but you know, I mean, yeah. So anyway, Not with you. With the you. idea is small, small increments of faith. And then yeah. we apply what the teacher said and we say, no, actually that made sense. Um, so yeah, that's what we mean by unflinching faith. Um, at, at a certain point, you're like, yeah, everything she or he told me is actually manifesting. I'm going to continue. I, I trust this person's integrity. I trust their character. I think they have my best interest in mind. They've, they've been walking on this path and I'm going to move forward with it. And I feel free. I feel liberated. I feel connected when I do it. And, and then, so that, and then I would say also that rather than just hearing all of this information and, and, um, considering it and so on, you begin to actually see the world through those eyes and it all clicks and all makes sense and your conviction becomes very strong. Dwight Stevenson says, faith with discernment versus blind faith. There you go. Okay. Hi. Please, so I, therefore. Go on. Oh, huh? go ahead. You're, gonna, you're in continuing. I was going to read that verse, but. I was just going to say that we saw that the, he's describing, I was a little boy, these great souls they spoke transcendental sound to me. Transcendental sound directly connected with Sri Krishna. I heard that sound and it delivered to me knowledge and it delivered to me spiritual opulences 
and ultimately deliver to me divine love, intimate loving service or bhakti. It all came through the sound. It all comes from sound. That's, it's, it's, we, we have a whole movement of sound. That's yeah. what this whole Bhagavatam thing is based on changing sounds. Isn't that interesting? What are the sounds in your house? What is the sounds in your car? You tell me what's the sounds of your house or the sounds in your car. What is the sound coming out of your television or your computers? And I will tell you what is the sound in your mind. In your mind. Right? It's this, this, the sounds that are going on in the house are creating us. The sounds on my headphones are creating me. Careful what sounds we're feeding ourselves with. And it's it, all, all, this whole bhakti thing is a practice of sound. It's a practice of refining the sound that we consume. What do you think about that? Kastuba? Refining the sound we consume. I like that. <laughs> Kastuba writes notes down because when he posts the podcast, he needs some stuff. Refining the sounds. Hurt okay, people. Hurt okay, people. Sound. Is that hurt a tattoo? Dogs. That's a tattoo. Hurt, yeah. hurt people. Hurt dogs. Hurt dogs. Hurt. <laughs> Look at Louis's dog there. Yeah. That's a love dog. Good, good dog. All right. <laughs> hurt dogs. Hurt. Don't hurt. Dogs. Loved dogs. Don't love hurt dogs. People. Okay. Love dogs. Love dogs. <laughs> Loved dogs. Love dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Please, therefore, describe the Almighty Lord's activities. The Almighty Lord. Like that's so Christian, isn't it? The Almighty Lord. <laughs> Please, therefore, describe the Almighty Lord's activities, which you have learned by your vast knowledge of the Vedas. For, for that are the hangs of great learned men and women at, 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 at the time, miseries of the masses of common people who are always suffering from material pangs. Isn't a great word? I'm suffering from a material pang. <clears throat> Oh man, I just got panged. Hold it, you got to read that again because you were you were buzzing out. Your, your connection oh, was yeah. Oh really? Okay, sorry. Please, therefore, describe the Almighty Lord's activities, which you have learned by your vast knowledge of the Vedas, for that will satisfy the hankerings of the great learned men and women, and at the same time mitigate the miseries of the masses of the mm -hmm. common people who are always suffering from material pangs. Indeed, there is no other way to get out of such miseries. All right, so the, this, the sound of the Bhagavatam, as composed by Vyasadeva, will satisfy all our hankerings, atma supersidity, satisfy the soul, and it will deliver us from the material pangs. All right. That's it's, all about he, it's all about hearing. Let's read what the purport says. Right. Narada Muni, from practical experience, definitely asserts that the prime solution of all problems of the material work is to broadcast very widely transcendental glories of the, of the Supreme. There are four classes um, uh, of good men acknowledge the authority. Why can't I read? The four classes of good men acknowledge the authority of the Almighty. And therefore, such good men, one, when they are in difficulty, when they are in need of money, when they are advanced in knowledge, and when they are inquisitive. These are the four types of pious people. This is from the Bhagavad Gita, seventh chapter. There's four types of pious people. We don't have time to talk about it. We don't that. have time. <laughs> we don't have time to talk about this. Let's talk about it tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Let's um, crank up the press. transcendental sound. Woo. Thanks for everybody joining us in the podcast. We do this every day. Yes, Wen KG and Hair Mustache. I can't remember your name. <laughs> hair Mustache is pretty Alexander. good. Alexander. I just call you that? Thanks for everybody joining us on Zoom, and thanks for everybody uh, listening to this podcast. If you like the podcast, you got to go to Apple Podcasts. Matter of fact, everybody on this show, besides chanting one round, should chant – should go to Apple Podcasts and do a five-star review. It helps our rankings and, say, and, and write some nice comments. Thank you. And we'll see you tomorrow. And Zoom people, sure enough, 15 people joined late on Saturday sleeping in. Ariel, Leela, Christopher, Sarah Oakley, Katie and Rasika and Jai Balai, Samantha, Joe family. 
Who we got here? Yeah. Geneva. You guys got to get that. You really got to get that visual on. Bruna G, Aditi G, Uruguaya family, Don Kaley Prabhu. Rade. Jay Shri Krishna Polo Jay Radhe. I am ready to start my day. <laughs> <laughs>